Hello, everyone. Apologies for our technical difficulties a while ago, but rest assured that the videos will be available um, at the website later on. And the Energizer serves as our war warm welcome for everyone who is now with us in, in the fifth Regional Disability Rights Dialogue 2022. Now, before I start, allow me to introduce myself. I am Karen Anu from the ASEAN Youth Organization, and I will serve as your master of ceremony for today's regional dialogue. I hope everyone gets to be comfortable with the dynamics and the system of Zoom and the Hubelo. If you have any thoughts and inquiries, please don't hesitate to ask us away in the live session chat box. Now, before we proceed, allow me to welcome you all formally in the first General Election Network for Disability Access, Fifth Regional Disability Rights Dialogue 2022, with the team of Implementing the Enabling Master Plan 2025, Opportunities for COVID-19 Response, and Recovery Through Digital Access and Economic Development. Now, to formally start our event, allow me to introduce our first speaker for today. Our first speaker this morning currently serves as the Vice President of Programs for the International Foundation for Electoral System, or the IFES. The International Foundation for Electoral System supports citizens' rights to participate in free and fair elections. Our speaker for today, provides policy and programming guidance to IFES international operations that currently include electoral assistance and democratic institution building in over 30 countries. He has actively contributed to the democracy and governance programming in the Americas, Central and Eastern Europe, South Asia, the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeast Asia. Ladies and welcome, Gentlemen, a big round of applause for Vice President Michael Sveltzik. Hi, Sir Michael. Hello, Karen. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our esteemed guests who are joining us from around the world for this fifth Agenda Disability Rights Dialogue. As was mentioned, my name is Michael Svetlik, and I'm the Vice President of Programs at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, IFAS. Since 1987, IFAS has been a global leader, uh, a nonpartisan, non governmental organization working in over 145 countries with civil society, public institutions, and the private sector to build resilient democracies that deliver for everyone. The General Elections Network for Disability Access, known as Agenda, was founded in 2011, over 10 years ago. It is a creative partnership between IFAS and organizations of persons with disabilities and civil society to improve access to political and electoral opportunities for persons with disabilities across Southeast Asia through increased public awareness and advocacy. Since 2015, Agenda has advocated for the rights of persons with disabilities and their organizations with national and regional bodies, including the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission for Human Rights and its task force, which has drafted the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan, a breakthrough regional document, regional policy document um, that recognizes and advances the fundamental freedom, freedoms of persons with disabilities. Agenda continues to build the capacity of persons with disabilities and their organizations to participate in national and regional decision-making processes and to mainstream disability rights while partnering with civil society organizations, electoral management bodies, ASEAN officials, and other key stakeholders to continue to advocate for the implementation of the Enabling Master Plan. At this moment, we have a critical window of opportunity to amplify these engagements as the Enabling Master Plan is undergoing a midpoint review process to evaluate the success of ASEAN and its member states, but also to identify opportunities that still remain to mainstream rights of persons with disabilities throughout the region. 
We are especially grateful for the continued support of the agenda program from the US Department of State's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, and also the Australian government's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. But most significantly, we're grateful to all of you for your support to this important topic as you contribute to this important topic. We recognize the challenges that COVID has presented to all of us in our communities. And while we all wish that we were together today in person, this event online is a great opportunity to welcome a diversity of voices and stakeholders from, a, from a, over the world, all over the world into this important discussion. Now we will hear from our distinguished keynote speakers. I am pleased to welcome Francisco Ben Cosme, the Senior Advisor to the Assistant Secretary at the East Asia and Pacific Affairs Bureau at the US Department of State. And also welcome the Acting Counselor for the Australian Mission to ASEAN, Daniel Sever. Once again, on behalf of the International Foundation for Election Systems, IFAS. I thank you for joining us and look forward to this event. Thank you so much and uh, welcome again everyone to the fifth regional dialogue of agenda and what an honor to have you Mr. Sveltik. Uh, thank you for that wonderful um, welcoming remarks. And uh, um, all right, I think before we proceed, I hope everyone in the live um, are doing great so far. And I hope you are becoming even more interested and excited to this upcoming regional dialogue. Now proceeding with our keynote speaker, as have what Ms. Mr. Sveltik have said, um, he is a senior advisor for the East Asian and Pacific Affairs Bureau at the Department of State. Prior to joining the Department of State, he was also a senior advisor at the Open Society Foundations covering Asia and Latin America. He is hailed as one of the Hill's top 2018 lobbyists for their campaign on Myanmar Rohingya issues. Before joining um, Amnesty International USA, he served as a professional staff member on the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee where he assisted the Democratic senators on issues related to East Asia, Pacific, South Asia, and State Department. He received his Master of Science in Foreign Service from Georgetown University, a graduate certificate from the USAF Air University, and his Bachelor of, of Arts degree from Wake Forest University. Please let us all welcome Mr. Francisco Ben Cosme. Hello, Mr. Ben Tosman. Karen, thank you so much for that uh, wondrous uh, introduction. Um, and thank you, Michael, um, you know, and all of IFAS for having me here. I also wanted to thank the Australian government, ASEAN, and all of our partners uh, in the agenda uh, for having me here um, and for the incredible work that everyone has done to make this regional dialogue uh, possible and inviting me uh, to speak here today. Uh, I'm particularly honored uh, to, to be here, uh, not just because of the opportunity to, to, um, to work uh, at the State Department and present before you, uh, but also because, um, as Karen mentioned, uh, I used to be a young civil society activist, uh, just like all of you, um, campaigning and advocating um, on disability as well as other human rights issues. And so it is really, um, you know, it's, it's so heartwarming to, to be uh, a part with um, regional civil society organizations uh, making progress. Um, and part of the reason I joined uh, this administration uh, is because we truly believe in putting human rights, uh, including disability rights, uh, at the center of our foreign policy. Um, one of the first actions that President Biden and Vice President Harris did was uh, appoint Sarah Mankara, a wonderful colleague and friend, uh, as the State Department's Special Advisor for International Disability Rights. She is a crucial voice and advocate uh, within the US government. Um, and together, we harness US energy uh, towards the protection, promotion, and respect for human rights, including disability rights, across bilateral, regional, and multilateral engagements, 
including within ASEAN and the larger Indo-Pacific region. At the Summit for Democracy, the United States uh, launched the Year of Disability Inclusive Democracy. And throughout this framework, we'll be engaging with countries globally to make new commitments to upholding the rights of persons with disability. We hosted an official side event on disability inclusive democracy with participation by foreign ministers from the UK and Norway and disability rights leaders from around the world. But democracy, as you all know, is a process and it demands that we all get involved. But too often, uh, people with disabilities can't fully exercise those rights. And sometimes that's because of blatantly discriminatory laws or policies. In a majority of countries around the world, people with intellectual disabilities are directly or indirectly barred from voting or from running for office. And often it's because people in power haven't taken the time to engage with disability rights activists, hire people with disabilities, and work to understand the needs of all people living with disabilities. With more than 1 billion people around the world living with disabilities, that's a big challenge for democracy, for human rights, and for all of us. In our promotion of disability rights, the United States shares expertise earned through decades of domestic experience while addressing new challenges, such as the disproportionately negative impacts of COVID-19 and the climate crisis on persons with disability. We know these issues are of critical concern worldwide. The COVID-19 pandemic shows just how important recovery and resilience efforts are to building a stronger, more equitable health system that does not leave anyone behind. Economic recovery should not dismiss the risk facing disabled and immune compromised communities. So maybe I'll just outline a, a four areas of strategy that the US is focusing on. First is that we're fostering accountability and capacity building for the promotion, protection, and advancement of the rights of persons with disability. Second, we're advancing disability inclusive democracy as launched at the Summit for Democracy. Third, we're advancing the human rights, dignity, and full inclusion of persons with disabilities, particularly in crisis situations, a problem we've seen far too often in the Asia Pacific region. And four, disrupting the narrative on disabilities, replacing negative stereotypes with the narrative of value. This dialogue is a perfect example of the kind of work we believe will create lasting, sustainable change. And even better, in concert with our partners and allies like the Australian government and our partners in ASEAN and with all of you in concert in civil society. So democracy is a collective endeavor and democracy is strongest when everyone can participate freely openly and equally, regardless of race, religion, gender, geography, identity, or disability status. The good news is that in places large and small, virtual or in-person, disability inclusive democracy is taking place. It is critical that human rights and values not only inform, but are similarly centered in the global response and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, we're encouraged that ASEAN has recognized this in its comprehensive recovery framework. As these discussions continue for the rest of the conference, we look forward to hearing from you, your ideas and opportunities to engage closer with civil society. Thank you so much again for having me. Wow, it is but of a great privilege to witness you only here at the fifth Regional Disability Rights Dialogue 2022. Thank you so much, Mr. Ben Cosme, for giving us an insight about civil societies, the opportunities and challenges for democracy and for people with disabilities across the world. Our now proceeding with our third speaker for today is an acting counselor at the Australian Missions to ASEAN. She is based on Bangkok, Thailand, and is responsible for managing Australia's regional human security and economic and inclusive growth investments. Prior to this, our third speaker was an assistant director and DFAT um, UN Economic and Development Section working closely on CAR funding and strategic partnership arrangements with UNDP, UNDCF, UNICEF, UNV, and UNFPA. She has also coordinated Australia's policy position on UN development system reform. And she has also joined DFAT, or formerly known as AUS8, in 2009 and has had um, carriage for several bilateral development cooperation relationships, including China, South Korea, 
Japan, Mongolia, and Taiwan. She also holds a master's in international affair from the Australian National University, majoring in Asia Pacific security. Please give it up for Ms. Daniel Sever. Hi, Ms. Daniel. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, uh, am I able to be heard and seen? My audio is working? Yes, Ms. Daniel. Great, thank you. Um, good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Australian Government, it's my pleasure to be joining this fifth Agenda Regional Disability Rights Dialogue. Thank you to our ASEAN Disability Partners, IFES and Agenda, and uh, for arranging today's event. This is an important opportunity for partners to reflect on ASEAN Enabling Master Plan progress and consider the impact of COVID-19 on the region's recovery through digital access and economic development. I would like to extend a warm welcome to my fellow keynote speakers, Mr. Michael Svetlik and Mr. Francisco Ben Cosme, as well as IT representatives for Indonesia and Thailand, Excellencies Yuyun Wayun Ring Rum and Dr. Amara Pongsavic. Thank you all for your ongoing support to disability rights in ASEAN. As the region focuses attention on COVID-19 recovery, it's important to ensure regional and national strategies include the needs of persons with disabilities. This regional dialogue is well-placed to explore issues from different perspectives and consider what more can be done for the most vulnerable. For example, by ensuring persons with disabilities are heard and their needs included in pandemic recovery plans. The value of agenda regional dialogues rests in the strong participation of disability partners to explore challenges and importantly, to be part of the solutions. The theme of digital access and economic development are important issues for Australia. Our investment in economic research in ASEAN area and digital trade standards, are just two such programs committed to mainstreaming gender equality, disability and social inclusion. We're working closely with ASEAN to promote and protect disability rights in the region, including in COVID-19 recovery. Protecting human rights for all is an essential part of our foreign policy. This is articulated in our COVID-19 development strategy, partnerships for recovery, and reinforced by our programs on human rights. It's further supported by our uh, ASEAN Australia Comprehensive Strategic Partnership, which is a new $154 million um, partnership that includes uh, an Australian for ASEAN Futures Initiative program. Our, our work places a strong emphasis on mitigating the pandemic's impact for the most vulnerable. And our programs support ASEAN's efforts to mainstream gender equality, disability inclusion, and human rights. This aligns with ASEAN's comprehensive recovery framework and implementation plan which is the region's pathway out of COVID-19. And wherever possible, we encourage partners to adopt a rights-based approach. Your sustained efforts with ASEAN to implement the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan are commendable. Australia continues to support organisations representing people with disabilities to engage with ASEAN bodies, to promote your rights and contribute to disability inclusion in ASEAN. We continue to encourage the active involvement of persons with disabilities in the master plan's implementation, but more can be done. We recognize the importance of ASEAN's human rights and social welfare bodies in this effort. The increasing importance of collaboration across ASEAN's communities and sectors, and that this collective effort can ensure no one is left behind in COVID-19 recovery. I look forward to learning more from our expert speakers, panelists, and participants over the next two days. And I encourage participants to use this opportunity to renew joint commitments, to ensure an inclusive, accessible and sustainable COVID-19 recovery for all, and especially for persons with disabilities. Before I conclude, I must raise Australia's grave concerns about the situation in Myanmar and its implications for regional stability. We condemn the use, continued use of force against civilians, including women and children, we reiterate our calls for restraint, a cessation of violence, and the immediate release of all of those arbitrarily detained, including Professor Shaw Turnell. We commend ASEAN's leadership in seeking to chart a course out of the current crisis and urge full implementation on the five points of consensus. Finally, I'd like to just recognize a few achievements since our regional partnership began in 2017. During this time, you have elevated disability rights in ASEAN from a regional action plan to an enab ASEAN enabling master plan. 
you have strengthened capacities of regional networks and organisations to advocate and implement disability rights in ASEAN. You have ensured collaboration with ASEAN bodies that continue to support the needs of people with disabilities, and in doing so, will remain valuable stakeholders in ASEAN's future decision making. You can all be very proud of these achievements, and I wish you all the very best in taking them forward in this dialogue. Thank you very much. Wow, what an amazing and empowered woman she is. Our deepest gratitude goes to you, Ms. Sever, for that insightful talk about recognizing the importance of cooperation and building bilateral relationships for opening the opportunities to people with disabilities. Also, um, thank you also for raising the awareness about the current crisis in Myanmar. Now, we before we proceed to our next speaker, um, feel free to share your insights and thoughts at the live chat box. Also, a big shout out to all the viewers out there who is watching us live. Welcome again to the first day of General Election Network for Disability Access, 5th Regional Disability Rights Dialogue 2022. All right, I hope everyone is ready to hear our next speaker. Our next speaker is a disability rights advisor in Agenda. He pursued his bachelor's degree in education from the Jakarta State University and his master's degree in the education from the Ohio University of the United States of America. He has certain 16 years of professional experience advocating for and providing technical advice for the promotion of the rights of persons with disabilities, particularly related to education, employment, political participation, human rights and social protection. In 2013, he also received the Inclusive Education Award from the Indonesian Ministry of National Education for his dedicated work on supporting the development of inclusive education system in Indonesia. Here with us today is a speaker that will talk about the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan and ACRF during the drafting process of the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan 2025 mainstreaming the rights of persons with disabilities. He actively involved in the task force representing the Indonesia representatives to AICHR or the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission to Human Rights. Um, please let us all welcome. Um, joining with us today is Mr. Talhas Damanik. Hi, Mr. Talhas. Hi, Karen, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so thank you very much, Karen, for your uh, nice, very nice introduction of uh, me and also my background and my work. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, very good morning, very good afternoon, good evening for everybody here, our distinguished uh, guests and participants of the uh, fifth uh, regional uh, disability rights dialogue. So very thank you for all of you to uh, to be able to participate and join with us in. Uh, uh, in this uh, very uh, wonderful moment when we, we will discuss several uh, things related to the disability right, in particularly because uh, ASEAN now uh, has the document called as ASEAN Enabling Master Plan. And it's also very timely because uh, uh, we are now, uh, uh, thank God that in several countries, uh, the, the COVID-19 cases is uh, uh, slow, uh, going down, but hopefully we, uh, we will enter the the, the new um, normal era soon, but uh, let's hope for also the disability inclusive recovery process uh, from the COVID-19. So that's why uh, today um, I will start with uh, giving uh, you some uh, hints or explanation or just a brief explanation about the uh, ASEAN enabling master plan and also the disability inclusive uh, ASEAN uh, uh, confer Comprehensive Recovery uh, Framework. So I think uh, Karen, yeah, share the screen. Um, let's start from the 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 the, the second slide uh, about the master plan. Um, uh, like already mentioned by our uh, previous speakers, uh, this uh, regional dialogue also inspired by the the, the launching of the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan 2025 mainstreaming the right of person with disability in 2018. Uh, next slide, please. 
uh, where the Asian Enabling Master Plan uh, was adopted into uh, in November 2018, and uh, the 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 midterm review sh uh, should be done uh, by 2021 or even this year 2022, and the final review will be done in 2025 where we expect that ASEAN become more inclusive for persons with disability. Next slide, please. Um, just uh, give you uh, the brief uh, background or information about the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan. Uh, like I already mentioned before, that ASEAN Enabling Master Plan was adopted in 33rd uh, summit meeting in, 2000, in 2018, meaning that all 10 ASEAN countries agree to adopt this uh, uh, disability um, rights uh, document, uh, and I think uh, the the reason why ASEAN agreed to this document is because first, uh, all ten ASEAN countries already ratified the UN Convention on the Right of Person with Disability. This is very powerful, powerful. But the the next uh, obligation is. Uh, uh, how the ASEAN can ensure that each member state and also at the ASEAN level, the, the UN Convention uh, on the Right of Person with Disability can be implemented. Uh, and uh, the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan is a document that uh, become a complementary to this, uh, uh, the, uh, in the UN Convention on the Right of Person with Disability. So the process of the development of uh, uh, the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan 2025 also inspired by the, the se uh, several uh, documents that uh, came beforehand. So even in, uh, for, uh, let's say in 2009, there is an ASEAN uh, Human Rights Declaration that's also mentioned about the right of person with disability. And in, 2012, in 2012, uh, we uh, sorry in 2011 ASEAN also declared the what is so called as a Bali Declaration, where ASEAN tried to uh, uh, ensure that uh, the disability rights uh, the, can be uh, enhanced uh, in uh, through throughout this the region and also in each uh, ASEAN member state. So uh, in 2015, where uh, ASEAN launched what, what's so called as uh, ASEAN Blueprint 2025. So the, those kind of um, documents that inspired the development of the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan 2025, because ASEAN really want to commit and really want to ensure that uh, disability rights uh, should be fulfilled and should be mainstream in all uh, pillar of the ASEAN. So uh, ASEAN Enabling Master Plan become the first uh, human rights uh, document uh, after the after that uh, came after the 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 ASEAN blueprint and become the 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 document that uh, really uh, uh, push for the cross pillar collaboration. So this is because uh, in the beginning uh, disability only uh, discussed in the third pillar. Uh, of the ASEAN, which is the uh, the social the social cultural pillar. As you may aware, that ASEAN has three uh, community pillars. First is the political security. Second is the economic community pillar, and the third one is the uh, social cultural pillar. So ASEAN really want to make sure that disability rights will be mainstream in those three pillars. Next slide. So. Like I mentioned before, that uh, ASEAN Enabling Master Plan uh, has been inspired by the ASEAN Blueprint 2025. So, uh, at the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan, uh, uh, the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan consists of 76 key action points related to the mainstreaming of the disability rights. Uh, 24 action points under the political security. 25 uh, action point under the economic community and 27 uh, action point under the so, uh, uh, social culture pillar. So um, uh, by, by having those uh, 76 act, key action points, uh, the ASEAN uh, really hope that uh, this is become the uh, reference for the, for, the, uh, for the ASEAN and also for the member state on how they can 
achieve the outcome of the mainstreaming of the right of person with disability. Next slide. So now I would like to uh, start uh, uh, discussing about the ACRF. Like uh, you may aware that uh, after the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic that has been uh, disrupted in all sector of the or our life, in, in including uh, person with disability in ASEAN. So uh, the ACRF, the, AC, the ASEAN uh, Comprehensive Recovery Framework, then. Uh, uh, adopted by the ASEAN in, in 2020 uh, and uh, and become the spirit of the ASEAN to um, move beyond of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to, the, the, to the recovery era. But the question is uh, whether the, 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 the implementation of the ACRF has been uh, included the right of person with disability. So that's why uh, in 2020, uh, in last year, IFS came with a new um, document as a position paper to the ACRF to discuss how uh, to discuss uh, how the ACRF document has been very inclusive for person with disability. Uh, in other in other words, we can say how we will see that the ACRF itself as a document and also its implementation that uh, that uh, after. Uh, has been uh, considered the, the right of person with disability. Next slide, please. Uh, the reason why we need to uh, ensure that uh, SCRF is very inclusive for, uh, for person with disability is because, again, we rely on the mandate of the ASEAN that has that has ratified the UN Convention on the Right of Person with Disability. So by uh, by having this uh, document, we hope that uh, ASEAN uh, can uh, this document can be uh, referenced for the ASEAN to ensure that uh, the, the the ASEAN and each member state can implement uh, the 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 UN Convention of the Right of Person with Disability and also achieve uh, the the, the ASEAN uh, Blueprint 2025, and also uh, by uh, implement the SRF, uh, it's also show the commitment of the ASEAN and all member states to the achievement of the SDGs in 2030. Next slide, please. So how uh, we uh, we develop this position paper? Um, <clears throat> actually, solely by uh, make a reference to the, each uh, uh, of the uh, priority action of the ACRF and try to link it with the uh, 76 key action points of the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan. So if you see in the ACRF document that consists of five uh, key uh, pr broad priority area from health, uh, human security and economic uh, integration and digital and uh, uh, the uh, community sustainability. So all uh, we try to give the reference to, to the ACRF uh, through uh, link uh, the, each of the uh, implementation uh, plan to the action point of the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan. Next slide, please. Uh, let me give you the example from uh, from uh, broad area uh, priority area one uh, health. So in this uh, case, if you see the, the 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 priority area is also to to make sure that uh, all community the health uh, services during COVID nineteen uh, recovery can be accessed by uh, all uh, community, including <laughs> it should be including person with disability. And in this uh, effort, we try to uh, uh, give a reference here uh, by also adding the, the column with the uh, action point from the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan, let's say the, AP, the APAC 13, the APAC 14, and also the, the action point related to health. Because even in ASEAN Enabling Master Plan, it is also mentioned that uh, the the countries or the the parties should be responsible to ensure that um, uh, health services is also made available 
for person with disability and has to be uh, easily accessed by them. So by having those uh, in um, in the same column, you will see here how the the AC, the SARF and the implementation of the action point of the action enabling master plan can be go together. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this one is uh, coming from the area two, the human security uh, that really uh, um, uh, push for an efforts uh, to ensure that uh, the, the protection of uh, uh, the community, including person with disability. Uh, here, uh, we also include the, the action point related to, let's say, the, uh, the, the provision of the uh, uh, social security uh, for a uh, person with disability. Next slide, please. And this is from the area three, which is the economic integration, uh, where uh, the uh, ASEAN really want to focus on the uh, the strengthening the SMSEs and so on, and give the opportunity for uh, any uh, possible a solution to make a, a community become more uh, 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 become a community can gain benefit from any uh, possibility to do the SMS SE. But how about the person with disability? Here we show uh, several uh, key action points related to uh, economic opportunities for person with disability, including uh, the uh, the the opportunity to. Uh, uh, gain more uh, benefit from the use of the digital technology and also start up and so on. Next. Okay, I think that's all my uh, uh, presentation about the ASEAN Enabling Master Plan and the SARF. Hopefully this uh, explanation can give you more insight uh, on your discussion after about the how um, ASEAN can move forward uh, to the recovery era and uh, don't forget to include the right uh, of person with disability when we talk about uh, all aspects from the ASEAN uh, re uh, Comprehensive Recovery Framework. Thank you. What an experience, truly. It was an honor to listen to the brief presentation of ASEAN Enabling Master Plan and the policy paper of ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework. Thank you. Our sincerest appreciation and gratitude goes out to Mr. Tolhas for giving us a great insight and background about these certain topics. Now that we have all been given the grace to listen to the best and outstanding leaders out here, we are now proceeding with our breakout session. Since most of us are also joined, are also just recently discovered how to use the flat platform, here is our quick rundown on how to join the breakout room. First, after the announcements and sessions have already ended, participants and the audience in the Hublot can exit the main um, session. And then second, after you exit the main session, please do go and click the Rooms tab in your Hublot screens and select the participants, um, select the join button and your screen. And then after the breakout se session, may I also remind everyone for closing plenary that we will be having a different meeting link. So after the breakout room, we will have to go back to our agenda session in the Hublot and then look for the closing plenary recommendations and insights from civil society. Now for the breakout rooms, we have five breakout rooms available and the breakout room will be tackling about the enhancing digital access and inclusion of persons with disabilities in five areas. There will be a facilitator assigned to guide on the discussions for the certain breakout rooms. In the first breakout room, it will tackle promoting electoral access and political participations for persons with disabilities and marginalized groups. And in this room, there is an available language provided for us, and that is Bahasa Indonesia. Again, for breakout room one, promoting electoral access and political participation for persons with disabilities and marginalized groups, the available language is Bahasa Indonesia. The second breakout room is about promoting disability inclusive employment policies. 
there will be a facilitator assigned to guide on the discussion for the certain breakout room. And in this room, there is an available language provided to us, and that is Malay. Again, for breakout room two, promoting disability inclusive employment policies, the available language is Malay. The third breakout room is about accessible information and COVID-19 response and recovery. There will be a facilitator assigned to guide on the discussions for the certain breakout rooms. And in this room, there is an available language provided, and that is Vietnamese. Again, for the breakout room three, accessible information and COVID-19 response and recovery, the available language is Vietnamese. The fourth breakout room is about mainstreaming opportunities for youth with disabilities in ASEAN. There will be a facilitator assigned to guide on the discussions for the certain breakout rooms. And in this room, there is an available language provided, and those are Myanmar and Thai. Again, for the breakout room four, mainstreaming opportunities for youth with disabilities in ASEAN, the available languages are Myanmar and Thai. The fifth breakout room is about promoting civic participation and conducting advocacy to mainstreaming disability rights. There will be a facilitator assigned to guide on the discussions for the certain breakout rooms. In this room, there is an available language and it is Khmer. Again, for breakout room five, promoting civic participations and conducting advocacies to mainstream disability rights, the available language is Khmer. Since I know most of us all want to constantly review our commitments in this session, our team have provided a cheat sheet for everyone to their important reminders and commitments in the General Election Network for Disability Access or Agenda, the fifth Regional Disability Rights Dialogue 2022. The cheat sheet can serve as your reference during your own discussions at the respective rooms. Um, the Energizer videos are also working now, so you guys are free, you guys are free to join and watch the Energizer videos once you are available. Now that we are all set, I guess this is the um, I guess it is time for us to part ways and enjoy our respective breakout room sessions for today. Thank you very much for the kind cooperation, and I hope you have learned a lot from our speakers this morning. Participants are now allowed to exit the main session and join the designated breakout rooms. After the breakout session, we will be having a 15-minute break, and we will be returning here on another different um, se session for closing plenary. So see you all later, everyone, and thank you so much. <laughs>